Nintendo has offered a few ways to play handheld games on your television over the years. Most prominently, the Super Game Boy for Super Nintendo and the Game Boy Player for GameCube. But the experience has some drawbacks. For those who might have a high quality GameCube video output solution, such as component video or the newer GC video options, the Game Boy Interface homebrew software for the Game Boy Player is an excellent tool that can improve image quality and input latency over the official Nintendo software. But now there's a new option, a real Game Boy Advance equipped with HDMI output and a Super Nintendo controller port. This is the GBA Consoleizer. In 2016, Stephen Williams, known online as Woozle, first began to openly discuss his Game Boy Advance HDMI output project. Years of development later, we've got the end result in our hands, and it's no exaggeration to say that this is one of the most exciting mods that we've ever tested. Woozle sent us early units for testing and feedback, while his distributor, Jason Rauch of GameTech US, provided us with final units and custom enclosures, which leave the cartridge slot open for front-loading action. GameTech has a pretty crazy variety of other case colors on hand, too. The GBA Consolizer is currently only designed for the original horizontal Game Boy Advance, model AGB-001. This is great because these units are generally not desired due to their unlit screens, and it's pretty easy to find a fairly inexpensive unit with a scratched up screen. Some systems use a 40-pin ribbon cable to connect the system's digital video to its LCD screen, while others use a 32-pin connection. The Consolizer kit is designed for 40-pin systems, but GameTech sells an adapter for a 32-pin system separately for $10. You can get an idea of whether you need the adapter by looking at the number printed on the system's PCB, visible through a tiny slit behind the battery cover. If this code on the motherboard starts with zero, then it's probably a 40-pin unit, but the only way to be sure is to open it up. According to GameTech, the Frosty Glacier units are a pretty safe bet for 40-pin connectors. If you just want a pre-assembled unit directly from GameTech, Jason is currently accepting pre-orders for those as well. Bob of RetroRGB considers the Consolizer to be an install that people with intermediate soldering skills should be comfortable enough doing. I've only just begun to try my hand at basic console modding projects myself, so this one might just be a bit above my current level. But if you think you're ready for it, check out Voltar's excellent installation video on YouTube. While the 3D printed enclosure with the plexiglass cover may look a bit more like a true consoleized system, the basic installation of the 3D printed lump replacing the GBA screen does have an extra bit of functionality. This version allows you to use the GBA itself as a controller. Since it's a pretty comfortable system to hold, more comfortable than the SP models, we'd say, this is a convenient way to play for those who may not have an SNES controller. Perhaps more importantly though, is that games with a built-in motion sensor can be played in this configuration. This is especially nice for Kirby Tilt and Tumble, since it's impossible to play the game using the lit screen of a Game Boy Advance SP due to the bottom loading cartridge slot, which causes the controls to be reversed. We found many full-size to mini-sized HDMI adapters to be rather touchy, so we suggest using a relatively lightweight cable that has the mini-sized HDMI port. Unfortunately, if you wanted to use fewer cables, you cannot use batteries in these modded systems. Currently, GameTech is selling this basic kit with the original GBA body for $140, and the enclosure kits for $30 more. If you want the cheaper one, the item that you need to select from the drop-down menu is black LCD. Buttons aside, the functionality of the full enclosure is identical to the basic kit. The enclosure even has the right hooks and connections for GameCube and GBA link cables in addition to access to the headphone jack, which is important and we'll explain why a bit later. But you want to be careful with the plexiglass cover, as we've heard that cleaning it with isopropyl alcohol will actually cause it to crack. Our only other particular concern with the physical build of both installations is that the SNES controller socket seems to hold the controller pretty tightly. So be gentle with your controllers when connecting them or unplugging them. Well, with all that said, let's put this thing through its paces and see what we can do with it. <laughs> 
consoleizer menu is accessed by hitting down and select simultaneously. Options in the submenu are cycled through by pressing left or right on the D-pad. To be honest, menu navigation feels a bit unresponsive. Woozle tells us that this is because of the way the controller is pulled during menu use. But the controller is pulled every single line for actual gameplay, so at least there's no added lag where it matters. We do wish that there was a failsafe against accidentally bringing up the menu, such as an IR sensor for menu functions or an option to disable hotkeys. While we haven't thought of any game where hitting down and select simultaneously might be common during gameplay, we've certainly done it on accident a time or two. The consoleizer maps A and B to their corresponding buttons on the Super NES controller, while Y doubles as an extra A input and X also functions as B. This way, confirm and cancel are exactly where you'd expect them to be on a Nintendo system, which works great for RPGs. However, this might feel a bit awkward for action games where most people probably are used to jumping with B and attacking with Y. If you prefer to use a more comfortable upward angle for your buttons, you could rest your thumbs over A and X and play that way instead. If that still doesn't cut it for you, simply go to the options menu and turn on the A, B swap. This way you can hold your thumb over B and Y just as you would for most Super NES action games. However, this also reverses confirm and cancel and may make on-screen button prompts a bit more confusing but we did rack our brains to come up with some interesting controller alternatives. For one, the 8 Doe Retro Receiver opens up a world of possibilities. Of course, there's the 8 Doe's own selection of SNES-styled controllers, but that's almost too obvious. And besides, they're notorious for D-pad issues. 8 Doe's far superior Genesis-styled M30 Bluetooth controller does work though, and might be fun for some Sega games like Gunstar Super Heroes or Sonic Advance. But let's get a bit more creative. Did you know that Nintendo Switch controllers work with the retro receiver if its firmware is up to date? Well, guess what? Those NES-styled Joy-Cons sync right up to the retro receiver and feel great for original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. But for GBA games, the tiny R and L buttons, while functional, don't feel wonderful to use. So we decided to buy 8-Bit Doe's G-Bros wireless adapter to see what was possible with its GameCube and Wii controller ports. For one, you can use an SNES Classic Edition controller, which is probably a lot fresher than your real SNES controllers. But for us, the most exciting possibility here is the Hori D-Pad controller for the GameCube. This controller was designed primarily for the Game Boy Player, after all, and for us has been our preferred GBA on TV controller for a long time. Well, guess what? If you flip the gray toggle from the Switch mode to the X input mode, it actually works. The tricky thing here is that the GameCube normally doesn't have a select button. So, in Switch mode, you lose that button. X input, however, treats the Z button as the select button, which, hey, might even be better in this case. Now this is what I'm talking about. The only other thing you have to do is go into the consoleizer menu and activate the AB swap, since X input reverses these buttons. But if you happen to be a bit sensitive to the lag caused by Bluetooth, there's no shortage of alternative SNES controllers out there. There's even an SNES controller designed specifically for Game Boy games the old Super Game Boy Commander by Hori. No matter what your preference, it shouldn't be too hard for anyone to pick a controller that they'd enjoy using with a GBA consoleizer. The GBA consoleizer outputs only one resolution, 1280 by 720, 720p. Now, this might seem kind of limiting, but it is absolutely the right choice given the resolution of Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games. The screens for the original Game Boy and Game Boy Color are 160 by 144 pixels. 144 might look like kind of an oddball number, but guess what? 144 times 5 is exactly 720. You can take advantage of this by visiting the video options menu and setting zoom to 5x. As long as your TV is set to not cut off any overscan, this will perfectly fill your screen's vertical space with glorious giant Game Boy pixels. Assuming your TV does a good scale of 720p, this should look pretty great. And hey, don't forget that 4K 2160p is three times taller than 720p. That makes for a whopping 15x scale of the original Game Boy Pixels. Of course, most TVs aren't going to do anything like a nearest neighbor type scale of 720p content, but I find that at least on my own 4K screen, 720p and 1080p are scaled equally well, resulting in an extremely crisp look for this type of pixely content. 
Game Boy Advance games, on the other hand, run at a resolution of 240 by 160. This is a bit more troublesome. So if we use the same 5x scale as with Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, we'll lose eight lines of the picture at both the top and bottom, which might not sound like a lot, but GBA games tend to use every bit of the limited screen space as possible, so we really don't want to lose any of that information. Setting to 4x, then, is the better choice for a clean integer scale. This does not entirely fill the vertical space, but in my opinion, it's close enough, about 89% of the screen's height. For comparison's sake, had the consoleizer been capable of outputting a 6x scale at 1080p, as you can do with GBA games on the Wii U Virtual Console, the exact same amount of the screen would be filled, so 720p really is the logical choice all around. Now, there is also a 4.5x zoom setting, and because 160 times 4.5 is exactly 720, this does completely fill the screen. But yeah, yeah, you already know what I'm gonna say. Non-integer scaling is a no-no because you'll end up with uneven pixel sizing, and therefore the screen will shimmer as the game scrolls. But this is not the case on the GBA consoleizer because Woozle has incorporated the magic fix, interpolation. When 4.5x is chosen, pixel edges are automatically softened just a bit so that the image still gives a sharp impression and pixels appear uniform in size so that you don't get that distracting shimmer effect. It appears to be a very simple but effective interpolation implementation. And while we're preferring to record in 4x because the sharp pixel edges are good for video editing, 4.5x is also a very worthwhile choice. So 4X or 4.5X for GBA games, and 5X for Game Boy or Game Boy Color titles. And luckily your GBA preferences are stored separately from the other two, so after you've saved your settings, you'll never have to change zoom sizing when you play one or the other. In terms of overall image quality while using original hardware, the GBA Consoleizer's chief competition is of course the Game Boy Interface Homebrew Software by Extremes for the GameCube Game Boy Player, specifically the high fidelity version. If you do have a high quality GameCube video output solution, in this case we're using component video via the GCHD Mark II, you can connect your GameCube to the open source scan converter, the OSSC, for 1080p output, an overall 6x scale of the GBA pixels. And this may be just a touch sharper than the GBA consoleizer depending on your TV. However, there will also be some slight visible analog noise, and it can take a bit of fiddling to make sure the pixels are sampled correctly. So this is definitely more of a power user sort of solution. Next, let's take a quick look at the artificial scanline options. At first, this might seem a bit strange for Game Boy games, since Game Boy screens don't have that separated scanline effect that CRT televisions do. But if you do like this effect, you can choose between three levels of intensity. The effect is more pronounced at 4x compared to 5x. But the real treat is the grid style scan lines, which are meant to look like a GBA's tiny LCD pixels blown up to gigantic size. This looks super cool, and while we're mostly recording with the effect off due to how patterns like this tend to not work well with web videos, I otherwise could see myself actually using this. I like the level one intensity, but the choice is yours. However, this is one area where 4.5x zoom sizing just doesn't work out. Whether you use the traditional horizontal scan lines or the LCD grid style scan lines, they just look very obviously uneven in this mode. So if you like the scan lines, definitely use an integer scale instead. The smoothing option offers two levels of emulator style smoothing if oversized pixel graphics aren't your thing. However, this feature only works when using 4x zoom. And you know, to be honest, something about this isn't so bad to my eyes when it comes to the limited colors and simple graphics in original Game Boy games. I mean, I personally would still never use this feature, but for whatever reason, I don't hate it as much as I usually do. The rest of the video options have to do with color. The palette setting is an especially cool feature, and one that I never would have expected to be possible with a GBA mod. Specifically, this is only for original Game Boy games. By default, palette is set to off, 
which allows the system to colorize Game Boy games the same way a Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance normally would. So as usual, certain games will boot with a pre-selected palette, but oftentimes they're really not that great. The default palette for Kirby games is just disgusting to me. And also as usual, you can override these palettes by holding various button combinations while the system boots up. Left and B is grayscale, which is a safe bet. Left and A isn't too bad either. Now, one advantage to the GBC and GBA colorization technique is that sprites and backgrounds are assigned different palettes, breaking the four color limit, which can be kind of nice, but personally, I always felt like it was kind of cheating and vastly prefer the way that the Super Game Boy for SNES handles color. The Super Game Boy allows for quite a bit of color customization for the Game Boy's four shades, but if you don't want to deal with that, there's also a menu filled with four pages of presets, and I have always been partial to these when it comes to how I like my Game Boy games to be colorized. Luckily for me at least, Woozle saw fit to include these in the GBA Consoleizer firmware. That's what the palette choices are based on. Now at first, you won't actually see the palettes change if the palette was set to off when you turned on the system. Choose a palette, any palette, save, and then restart. Now the system will boot into a custom grayscale mode that allows Woozle to map the tones more easily. A variety of pleasing options are available that work well for a range of different games. If you're like me and prefer your Game Boy games to have a greenish tint, then palettes A5, D3, E4, and E5 are just a few of the ones worth checking out. One small hitch though, it seems that these palettes do not work when using a Game Boy EverDrive, possibly because it boots the system into a GBC mode. So when using earlier games through an EverDrive, you are simply limited to the usual palettes that you can use on a Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance. The only particular complaint I have for how these are implemented is that for palettes that don't use pure black as the darkest shade, the black space surrounding the game window is also tinted. And you know, if that doesn't bother you, great, but leaving a solid shade like this for extended play on my OLED TV makes me feel a bit antsy, so I've only been using the palettes that include true black. The big thing that's missing, of course, are the Super Game Boy enhancements and supported games such as the palettes that can use way more colors and change from scene to scene. Those are handled by the Super Nintendo itself, and the necessary hardware to use those palettes was never included in GBC or GBA systems. As an aside, since the Super Nintendo displays at a wider aspect ratio than actual Game Boy screens, the consoleizer will look narrower, but is more true to the game's intended proportions. Getting a proper square pixel aspect from a Super Game Boy can be achieved with upscalers or custom sizing on the Super NT. The last two options in the video menu, Shader and Gamma, affect all games. Because there are so many different types of screens that these games could have been played on, people might have different opinions about what the colors should look like. Or in many cases, the developers might have used overly garish colors to compensate for the extremely dark screen of the original Game Boy Advance. By default, the consoleizer's output is pretty vivid, which you might like. It feels akin to playing on a brighter backlit AGS 101 or DS Lite screen. But if you feel like the colors are burning your retinas, the preset color shaders are meant to mimic GBA, original DS, and uh, PSP screens? Sure, why not? For the most part, we've been recording without shaders, except for the original Game Boy game. The GBA shader helps make the greens look a bit more pea soupy, just like I like them. All of these options are a bit more muted compared to the default colors, which does suit certain games. If you bump the gamma to 2.4, then the shaders increase in contrast a bit, which may look kind of nice. For reference, the GBA consoleizer does output full range color. If you'd rather dial in your own look, then set the shader to CW1 and then back out to the main menu. Here, you'll find the color wizard. This lets you make the image look warmer or cooler, darker or more desaturated. The shader and color wizard settings can also be useful when using the palettes for original Game Boy games. And in theory, you could push these color tones to look quite different from how they normally are, in a sense expanding the color palette customization even further. 
that's it for the video options. But there's one more visual aspect we gotta discuss that impacts how the GBA consoleizer compares to other methods for playing GBA games. Which might be a good thing or a bad thing depending on your perspective. Similar to the high def NES, which is an HDMI mod kit for the original Nintendo, the GBA consoleizer alters the system's speed by just a tiny, imperceptible bit to maximize compatibility with modern displays. This is because the native screen refresh of everything from the original Game Boy on up to the Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance is approximately 59.7 Hz, and thus, this is the frame rate that the games target. This is kind of a weird frame rate though, so there's almost always some kind of compromise when bringing these games to the big screen. For instance, the Super Game Boy, Super Game Boy 2, and Game Boy Player all exhibit some greater or lesser degree of stuttering in the video output because 59.7 Hz doesn't quite match the Super Nintendo or GameCube refresh rates. The various versions of the Game Boy interface software deal with this in different ways. The standard version uses temporal interpolation. The speedrunning version just straight up outputs 59.7 Hz, which could cause compatibility issues while the high fidelity version forces the GameCube to use 60 Hz output. The GBA Consolizer's method for circumventing this is to instead overclock the system by just a fraction of a percentage so that the frame rate jumps from 59.7 to 60, which makes it so that the frames are perfectly synced to the HDMI's 60 Hz output. This should work with any modern display and produce absolutely no scrolling stutter. This exact timing is also how the GBA Consolizer is able to keep the input lag at zero. But always remember that you're going to need a low lag display to take full advantage of that. While this sounds great and all, this speed discrepancy can be a huge problem for some people, even if the difference is not humanly perceptible. I mean, check this, the consoleizer gains only about one and a half seconds over the course of five minutes. But still, even if it is a real Game Boy Advance, that might tip the scales just far enough away from authenticity for some people to accept, especially speedrunners. When we asked Woosel about this, he gave us two interesting bits of information. First, the consoleizer board actually has a solder jumper that can be closed to allow for running the system at its original speed. But as of right now, he feels that this feature needs more testing, and is not yet offering a 59.7 Hz firmware. Hopefully, eventually, though. Secondly, he told us that the consoleizer uses a very high-end oscillator, so that the system runs at an extremely precise frequency, more precise than even the stock GBA oscillator which he says doesn't stick to the specification very tightly. So that sounds cool, and make of that what you will. However, there is one aspect of the GBA consoleizer's output which may cause compatibility issues for some people. In the Systems option menu, you'll find the setting for the DVI Plus mode. As is the case with many community projects like this, the HDMI output is actually using DVI protocols. But it's not exactly to spec. That's because DVI isn't supposed to carry digital audio, but you can kind of force it to. However, not all displays and devices may approve of how this is done. In our particular setups, our LG OLEDs would see a direct connection between the TV and the consoleizer. In trying other TVs and computer monitors, compatibility was hit and miss, with most of my newish displays having no problem. In most cases, this is likely your only concern, so this could bode well for your chances. In our situation, we have an additional layer of complexity because we like to capture and stream our gameplay. As we covered in RGB 106, we currently both use a Denon X3400H AV receiver for distributing our HDMI sources to TVs and capture cards. Unfortunately, the consoleizer's DVI Plus mode did not work for us through our receivers, yielding the dreaded no signal. However, the consoleizer will work with DVI Plus mode turned off, but this also means that the HDMI output won't carry any audio. So if you're considering buying the consoleizer, you might need to be prepared to come up with an audio workaround. This is why it's so important that you can still use the Game Boy Advance's headphone jack, since you may have to use analog audio in your setup. There may just be a glimmer of hope for those who find this particular audio situation to be a deal breaker. During the production of this episode, I found that running the GBA Consolizer's HDMI cable through an intermediary device of some sort can improve DVI Plus compatibilities with various components. I was able to test both a View HD HDMI splitter with audio breakouts and this JTEC HDMI audio extractor, 
both of which allowed my Denon AV receiver to see the signal and fix all my issues. But it's important to keep in mind that my results are purely anecdotal and by no means a guarantee. But adding one of these fairly inexpensive devices to your video chain may just be what you need to make everything sunshines and rainbows again. <laughs> On that note, we have one final system option to look at, the Audio LPF. No, it's not going to get rid of the grainy sound that the system is known for, but this setting allows you to cut out some of the less pleasant frequencies you might hear in GBA audio. However, the LPF only applies to the digital output, which again hinges upon the DVI Plus mode compatibility. We've been told that a small number of games apparently do exhibit audio pops with the way that the GBA's digital audio is upconverted to 48 kHz for HDMI output. Even if it's an uncommon issue, that may convince you that maybe analog audio is the better, more authentic choice anyway. The GBA consoleizer has been a long time coming, but it has certainly been well worth the wait. It's simple to use and presents games from the entire Game Boy family in fantastic quality. For the most part, it has all of the features that we would have ever wanted from such a mod, along with several others that we never expected. And overall, we feel that Woozle has made smart choices where compromises were necessary. For those who do have the means to use homebrew and the equipment to get the most out of it, the Game Boy interface software for the GameCube Game Boy Player is an equally viable choice for the ultimate GBA video output experience. It really just comes down to whichever suits your playstyle better. But I just love that we've got all of these ways to bring our favorite handheld games onto the big screen, to make them look their best, to be able to capture them and share them, and to give them the spotlight that they deserve. Thank you.